Okay, I think we're set. Um, this has kind of turned into this session um, from an ASAP integration session, really into an ESS conversion touch base session. Um, when we originally set this up, um, we originally set it up for actually a timesheet session, which hasn't really, um, isn't available um, to be used at this point yet. And so it went from that to, I switched it up to an ASOP session. Um, and be, because of the last uh, re full release that we did, not the hot fix, the 2024.1 release, um, we announced that ASOP wasn't quite ready yet, the ASOP integration. Um, and it won't be ready until um, beginning of August. So um, I decided then to switch it up this week and um, make it more of a touch base session. Um, and so for this session, I've got kind of a list of things, housekeeping items that I want to discuss, as well as um, an opportunity for those of you that have done some conversions for your districts uh, to talk about your experience as well. Um, so that's kind of how it's it's uh, turned into here. Um, but I did want to talk about the ASAP integration first and just where it's at at this point. Um, and so we're you know right now we're working that the development team is working with Frontline. Uh, Matt and Mark have been in constant communication with them, um, just trying to improve that integration. Um, the the main issues that we're that we're working through, and you know obviously that's including the pull from um, ASAP and how that's going to work, how they're going to come over, you know, what is the status of what they are in ASAP when they come over, things like that. So um, so we're working on all of that and um, Frontline is doing some work on their end to approve those or to improve the uh, statuses on their end. So things get pulled in nicely into ESS. So that's all being worked on right now. And I think from what Mark said on his release uh, notes from 2024.1, um, that uh, some of this will be completed on the 2024.2, which is scheduled for today. And then the rest of it should be wrapping up the ASAP integration pieces in the 2024.3, which is scheduled for next Friday. So, um, and as he stated in that email, because we are, you know, trying to get all of this resolved, um, you know, you are to hold off on doing any type of conversion of those districts who use ASAP until this is complete. Um, so, you know, I think a, a good game plan here is if your district was using, or if your ITC was using kiosk, is to um, convert your ITC over, and then those districts that aren't using Frontline, um, convert them over, and then, you know, finally uh, go in and convert those districts that have ASAP integration, and then the timesheets, which I think there's only a handful of, of districts using timesheets at this point, then those districts can be converted over after timesheets is fully available in ESS. So um, that's kind of, you know, where, what I know in regards to the ASAP integration. So it sounds like, you know, here, you know, within the beginning of, uh, of August, we will have um, most of that in play. So um, in place, so it's, um, I, we appreciate your patience with all of that and your understanding. Um, but we want to make it right before um, we uh, make that available to all of you. Um, so that's the ASAP integration piece I wanted to talk about. So any questions before I move on to my next topic? Now, in the guidelines, and I've got that in here. We have added an area about ASAP. So when it is available um, and you guys can start converting those districts that use ASAP integration, um, we have some steps in here in regards to how to turn it off in kiosk. 
um, we found out that um, the ITC um, administrator role, kiosk administrator role, did not have the capabilities of doing that. So the developers um, that work with kiosk, um, their a group called Insum, um, and uh, they went in and updated the ITC kiosk administrator role to allow ITC staff to turn off the kiosk area in, or to turn off the ASAP area in kiosk. And so this area here, you know, talks about what you will need to do in order to cancel those sync jobs between kiosk and ASAP and to actually turn off that ASAP integration in kiosk. Um, so that's supplied here um, as part of the kiosk area of this guideline. And I did want to talk about this guideline. It's it's not a checklist. Um, it's purposely called a guideline for a reason because, you know, we aren't, um, you, you know, everyone is doing this differently um, because of if you're hosted with the Management Council or if you're not, um, you know, if your districts use leave requests or if they don't, we don't know the ins and outs of what's happening um, with your districts and how many districts um, are using what options in kiosk. Um, so we've provided a guideline as to what is going to affect or benefit all, regardless of the situation. Um, so that's why um, you know, we have this guideline and we have received feedback from a few ITCs saying, hey, you know, could you add this? Could you add that? And there are very valid ones that were like, absolutely, yeah, we, we need to add that one. But, it, you know, there are some that it might be specific or unique to your situation at your ITC. So, you know, we kind of want to hold back on just putting in a bunch of things that may not apply to all. So that's why, you know, we really would recommend, you know, you guys using this guideline as a reference, you know, as a template for any checklist um, that you want to create for your ITC that's gonna benefit your districts. Um, but yeah, we are, you know, as you can see, we, we do go in and update this. Um, we had, uh, you know, we're basically still on the same conversion timeline. Um, as far as I know, none of that has changed. Um, when it comes to legacy kiosk, you know, we added some of this information about the outstanding leave requests. And these are just recommendations you guys have a better plan for your ITCs or for your districts, that's awesome. Um, if you have a checklist that you're working off of that you would think would be beneficial uh, to the other ITCs, feel free to share that. Um, but, you know, this is kind of where we're at with where, you know, some steps that need to be taken in the kiosk part of it, um, turning off the ASAP integration in kiosk. And then this area here is talking about things that you need to do for the employee self-service. So this takes you into, you know, if you need, you know, using those building code types. I know we had a little bug with that, that we had hot fixed this, this past week. Um, you know, you need to make sure that that stuff's entered in into USPS and the core codes. Um, we've got the link to the installation guide and that's for districts or ITCs that host them, you know, locally themselves. Um, Chad has instructions for those of you that host with the Management Council. Um, and then we've got the steps on how to extract data out of kiosk. And we're going to touch upon some of these things here uh, this morning, as well as um, the import steps, taking those extracts from kiosk and importing them. We made a few updates uh, with that document. So I want to talk about that. And then I want to get into some of these uh, roles. I just added this uh, this last week. Um, I felt like, you know, uh, we we were receiving tickets like, where's the role stuff? And, you know, where's that at? And I'm like, you know, we have that in the user chapter because roles are discussed in there. And I'm like, but this may be something good to have in the guidelines so you guys can see this stuff um, at the beginning. And that you can also see what options does each you know, user have in ESS. So we've linked those two documents in here. 
And um, and then this just talks about the workflows en engine. If it isn't already set up because they aren't, you know, they're using you uh, onboarding in USPS or requisition approval system and USAS, then they aren't, then you need to get that going. Um, and then the post import steps are things that, um, you know, can be done afterwards. And uh, we're gonna touch upon uh, some of these as well. I know we, we have received tickets regarding um, email and user logins. And so I wanted to talk about those and just go into those in a little more depth um, to help you know, prepare uh, you guys for how are the uh, users going to log into ESS. Um, we don't have a self-registering yet uh, for them to self-register um, in ESS like they could in kiosk. Um, that is a JIRA issue that we have out there. Um, but I wanted just to provide what does the bulk reset do versus the forgot password link. So I just want to talk about those things today as well. Um, so, so any questions about um, the ESS guideline document? I don't see anything in chat. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about are the kiosk extracts and I do have a sample district here kind of our, our sample district we have and I'm, I'm logged into kiosk and I just want to talk about what's been happening with those lately um, and so I'm logged in I'm looking at a particular district and I'm looking at their configuration screen in kiosk and if I scroll way up to the top, I'm going to see all the kiosk export files. So for those of you that really haven't gotten into this yet and kind of taken a look at what's happening here, um, the kiosk extracts are in the test instance. They are not stored in the live kiosk instance. And the reason being, obviously, got a lot of data, a lot of extracted data in here. Um, and they didn't want to, um, have any performance issues in the live instance, therefore they put the extracts in here. And the kiosk developers took care of all of this. InSum was the one that got all of this uh, available and ready for us. Um, and so in here, uh, up at the top, you're going to see possibly maybe four, maybe up to six different files. And those are all explained in that extracting out of kiosk document that we have out there underneath the appendix. Um, but the one that you guys are going to be working with to pull that extract CSV files out of kiosk in order to import into the ESS kiosk load option, you're going to be dealing with the no USPS. Now, we ran into some issues earlier this week or maybe last week, I don't know, the weeks are flying by, um, where it was creating like several versions of the same file um, per day. So like, for example, on the 22nd, I could have had four no USPS files out there. Um, and so we, you know, informed the kiosk developers about that. And so they fixed that earlier this week. Um, so you should see a daily no USPS. And so this is the most recent updated uh, information of the extracts that are coming out of um, kiosk. Um, so they're pulling them from the live instance and putting them in this test instance daily. And so um, in order to get the CSV files that are stored in this zip folder, you need to download it. And once you download it onto your uh, laptop, you need to unzip it. So if you just downloaded it, excuse me, I got a net here, and you start clicking and um, it will, and you see the list of CSV files in there, uh, you're not gonna get very far because it wasn't unzipped, speaking from experience. So um, what I would do is the minute you downloaded it, download it is in your uh, whatever uh, downloads folder, or whatever you're using, um, there should be an unzip or right click and unzip that folder. And then once you unzip it, you still may have to click a few times to actually get to the list of CSV files. 
But once you click on, on you know, one of those CSV files, you'll be able to, to see the data. Um, so that's just kind of like a little tip um, when you're trying to download these. So if you don't see any no USPS uh, zip files for your one of your districts or several of your districts, please create a ticket. Um, and when you create that, really want you to create that um, in the Salesforce system because our the InSum kiosk developers do not have access to state software service desk. So they do have access to um, the Salesforce ticketing system. And so if we do run into a situation where you're not seeing the, this information, then you definitely um, need to create a ticket into Salesforce. That way, if we need to contact the in some developers, we can escalate that ticket to them. They can see all the details about, you know, districts and, and your information that you entered into that ticket. Um, so when it comes to kiosk and what, you know, problems you're seeing in kiosk, please create those tickets in Salesforce. It just makes it easy for us to escalate that to um, the kiosk developers. Um, you will see other um, files in here as well. There is an in USPS one, and um, I think they're trying to get that going weekly. I have not been in here this week to like confirm all of that, uh, but that's the one that contains um, the district's leave requests. It's underneath the in USPS. And I'm gonna talk about that here in a little bit more detail. And then there are other ones as well. Um, and so, Eventually, you know, you're going to have to take those files and archive them and place them somewhere to store in case um, the district needs them, um, audits asking questions, things like that. You just want it in a, an area that um, it's accessible to the district. So that's a conversation that the ITC and, and the district have to have to eventually extract that uh, those archived files here, these zip files, and, and archive them somewhere. And that's all explained in that um, extract um, guideline. Okay. Make sure I have all my notes that I want to talk about in here. Okay. I think I do. Any questions on the exports or things that you uncovered while exporting the files out of here? And I may go back to this to talk about um, some other things that we've encountered. You know, it's great because I know you guys are actively, um, you know, going in and doing conversions. I've heard, you know, there are some ITCs that have converted several districts over so far. That's awesome. And, um, you know, it's it's been busy, right? You know, it, there's been a lot of questions, a lot of tickets coming in, but that's a good thing. Um, because, you know, there are things that we are discovering that need to be fixed. And I tell you what, our development team, um, are the rock stars, they're out there, they're going in, getting that done. They could be doing a hot fix that day. And they're very responsive to all of this. So, um, you know, we appreciate your understanding, trying to get all these kinks out here at the beginning. And I know you guys are used to that because, you know, we went through similar things with our USAS payroll and inventory migrations as well. So we appreciate your understanding and patience through all of that. Uh, can we create the CSV files at any time or is it only overnight? Um, so Brenda, are you, are you saying like the CSV files that you're downloading from Kiosk, um, they're done daily, like they run them overnight and they're available the next day? Okay. Yeah, I just had some people working on things and I had to wait until the next day before I could pull that data in. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, they're doing it. I think it's kind of like a nightly routine is what the kiosk developers are doing. So um, then it's available then the next morning for you to download that, that file, that version for that day. Okay. So what I'm going to get into next is 
The import guide, the kiosk import guide, the document that you guys use that has the steps to actually take this extracted data and import it into ESS. So let me get to that here. So our user manual, the installation guide, which is the guide for those that um, self-host, you know, how to create your instances and all of that good stuff is in the installation guide. But this is the one I'm talking about. And this is our ESS import from kiosk guide. And I appreciate the feedback on this as well. We have been adding things in here and the developers, um, when we receive feedback from people like, do you think you can pull this from one of the extracts from kiosk and import it in? Um, we have been making changes to this. And so I do have to watch myself because if one of the developers slips in another import step, I have to make sure <laughs> that these get updated up here if you have districts that aren't using leave requests, it kind of bumps the, the order here. And so, um, so for those of you that do not have districts that are going to be using leave requests in ESS, you know, there are certain steps in the import process that you can skip, but you know, we do, you do have to do these in order. So you can't jump from subcategories back up to users. That's not gonna work. So you do have to make sure that you do these in the right step. Okay, and I got a remark here. Our process is to turn off leaving kiosk when the district has approved and exported all leave. That's, that's great. Then the next morning we export the kiosk files. So since it was turned off overnight, I think we need to use one from the previous morning. We found different data in both, I, you know, it is, it's just a, a matter of just going out there and kind of looking to see. Um, but yeah, from what I understand, these are getting, you know, pulled nightly and then the prior night's information is available that morning. Okay, so um, with this import process, I just wanna talk about some of the updates we have made here. For one, uh, we linked to this. And I know that was difficult. You guys were scrolling down, you know, doing a step and then like, where, where, where did I leave off? Um, you know, by just clicking on these links, it'll take you right to that area of the uh, document. Um, and it will include um, then what you need to do in that step. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, and then you can, you know, scroll back up to the top. And then, you know, say, okay, I just finished users. Now I want to go to time preferences and you can click on that. But we made sure we had a, a link available in here. Um, some of the other things I wanted to talk about in here. Can you add the numbers to the bottom sections too, please? Yeah, they don't have the numbers now, do they? Yeah, that can be done. I'll make note of that. All right, um, that's a good point. So like, yeah, one, two, three, four, got it. Um, okay, so one thing I wanted to talk about in here is uh, when you're going in and you know, you got the file ready to go and you're ready to import it. And so I'm gonna use the users one as an example. It seems to be the one we have, have had quite a few questions on, um, is that when you're loading it in, you definitely want to make sure that you're watching the process. You're watching it load. Um, and I know you guys are familiar with that. I mean, you got to do loads and payroll. We had the whole inventory migration and all of that. Um, but I think I have a screenshot up top here. And so, you know, when you go in, you know, let's say I select the user load um, and I select the CSV file and I click on import, you're going to see possible error count and a records loaded count. So this is basically going to tell you, you know, you have 10 errors and you have maybe 25 loaded. So that's kind of an indication to me, I must have about 35 lines on that spreadsheet. And that's where, you know, you check out the spreadsheet you are trying to import to see what's going to confirm. 
So if you're like, oh, okay, so 25 loaded and 10 didn't, why? You are going to get a CSV file of the ink that contains the data that did not load. So those errors are going to show in this CSV file that's generated afterwards. The errors also appear underneath this message area. Um, so you're going to see them both in here, and you're going to see them in um, the CSV file that gets generated. So um, obviously, if there's something where you're like, I have no idea why this isn't loading, create a ticket, and we'll take a look. But we're trying to put those errors out there in the document. Um, and so we're trying to, to put that information, show you one that has it, in a possible errors condition area. And so, and, and you know, we're explaining what the error could be and then, uh, or what the error is, and then what the possible solution could be. Um, and the one that we've run into in regards to the user import is, the uh, password column. Now you're like, but passwords aren't getting converted over. We know. Um, and so one thing to uh, look at when you're viewing, let me go back up, each of these steps, you know, is what ESS is looking for, right? So when it comes to the user extract, it is pulling in, or it's going to be looking at this information and trying to import it in. Um, now, if you guys have comments or suggestions about improving this, um, let us know. Um, it's, you know, I, when I look at the headers here, I look at the kiosk, or the, yeah, the kiosk uh, user CSV file, and I'm like, okay, username is their username. That's going to get loaded in, whatever their kiosk username was, which we seem to find out is their email address. That's going to get loaded in as their username in ESS. Um, their admin priv, that was their role. And so when you look at that extract from kiosk, you see all those different roles. Some of those, um, or those should get be. Um, imported in. We have run across a couple situations that we've got JIRA issues and we've already hot fixed um, to fix some of that because some of those roles weren't coming in. Um, so obviously, if you know, you're checking things out and comparing um, what got imported in, if you find some issues, create a ticket or look into it. Um, but with this user role, uh, what we found out, and I labeled that in here on the error is that even though that password, you know, that wasn't one of the file or the headers or columns that are getting pulled in, there could be some like foreign characters in there that are getting loaded in. And, and that's not uh, something that we can prevent. It's kind of like an Excel issue. Um, and so a CSV spreadsheet issue. So you can load it in and you'll get the CSV file with any that didn't load in. You may have no issues at all and it loads in perfectly. Um, so you can either take a precautionary step by going in and opening that Excel file and just removing that column. I think it's column, yeah, column K, the password column, clean it out um, so that it doesn't load in or you can let it run. And if you see that, you know, you're looking at your count and you still have 10 errors, but 150 loaded in, you can open up that CSV file that was generated from the import and you can edit that, clear up the uh, password column and then take that file and do another import with that file. And that should clear up the rest of them and allow those to load in. So it's up to you. Um, and we have that explained here. Um, but if you're like, I just want to avoid that altogether from the get go, then I know we have up here that you shouldn't edit these files. We kind of have a disclaimer. Um, but, you know, until we encounter an issue, right, then, you know, we can change this up a little bit. Um, so it doesn't hurt to do that. 
And I know some of you are your posting stuff here that you've um, had some issues with that. So I'm going to stop here and see what kind of questions you have here. You did notice that an empty file when you load will just spin. So, so Heidi, with that one, you're saying um, your extract was was empty to begin with. Is that correct? Gotcha. Okay, we'll make note of that. Keep a copy of, of the chat notes after this to look into some of these. Um, and then Jen, you said you ran into that error twice yesterday and it the fix worked perfectly. That's great, good. Um, Brenda, do email addresses need to match email addresses in USPS now like they used to? Um, no, actually. Um, what's gonna happen is that whatever the email address is that is on that extract, so let me look here. So when that gets loaded in, um, that uh, the email address that is populated in the user account, that's the email address that is going to be used for emailing leave, re leave re request approvals. So it's going to use that one. So if that needs to be changed, you will need to change it in ESS in the user record. Some of our user errors were due to school and personal email addresses, both being used in kiosk. It allowed users to register with any email addresses that were entered in the USPS. Okay. All right, I'll have to look into that. It only loaded the first email address that came across for the employee and errors out in the next email for the same employee. All right, we'll look into that too. When I had the password error, I did not get a report, just an error. So I don't know who loaded. Hmm. Yeah, you should have received. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, because you would have received like an error.csv file when it loaded in. Um, and that's the thing, too. I think each of these, when they load, when you create a, an import, in here and it creates that resulting csv file they're all called error.csv so you do have to be you know when you're when they're being created um is to rename them to match you know what option you were using to import michelle can i interject for a second yes, Sarah, uh, please i think what she's saying is that um if it didn't load anybody or you can't tell if they loaded anybody or not. You get that error where it just kind of blows up. Um, gotcha. It did not load anybody. The error um, report shows that nobody's loaded. It doesn't show anybody loaded. So it's, it's just blank, right, Mary? It yes. doesn't have any. Mm -hmm, correct. This is Tanya. Okay. What happened was I loaded the users and it told me so many were loaded, but an error popped up. And it was one of those Java things, but there was no CSV report for me to identify who loaded, who didn't. Did, did you uh, check the users after that to see if I anybody checked the users there? and I just was spot checking. Eventually, um, the Java error said which line had caused the error. And that mm -hmm. was the first line that had a password listed. Yeah. But so was anybody no was, CSV report was CSV file was ever generated for me to know who did not upload. But but did you go back into the users area to see if anybody actually got loaded? Yeah, yeah. There were several in there. So there were people loaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the report didn't show anything. Right. So what I eventually ended up doing was I just deleted everything in the password column, re-uploaded, and then I got an error report of everybody that already existed, but it loaded the remaining people. And then it didn't duplicate, correct? Correct, it did not. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay. good to know. Um, yeah, and I know that's hard, Tanya, because spot checking, you could have 500 people that you're trying to import in, and that would be kind of impossible to, <laughs> to spot check who came in from the uh, CSV file. So. Um, 
I don't know. I it sounds like the best practice is just clear it out, and um, yeah, maybe we'll update this just to say, you know, before you load your users, remove that column entirely, and then import in, just so we don't run into any chances of things getting imported in, or or half of them did, and now you don't know who didn't, but. You know, like you said, Tanya, even though, you know, you use the original file then to, you know, load it again and you got the error saying this one's already on file, it didn't duplicate it. So that's okay too. Um, but yeah, I think that might be the way to go. I'll make note of that as well. Okay, good feedback. Okay, so let me get back on track here. If there's anything else that uh, I know that we have, some of you have created some tickets, you ran into a problem with loading groups or group chains and things like that. Um, and, uh, and you got some really odd errors. Um, and obviously, you know, we don't know what the error is until until that experience happens. So keep just creating those tickets and we'll you know look at that. Some of it's so unique that um, you know the developers will indicate that um, that it may not warrant an error to be documented here. Um, and some of them are bugs. We had one from an ITC yesterday, um, and uh, it was an actual bug on our end that needed to be fixed. So we hot fixed it and it's ready to go. So hopefully um, you guys don't encounter that situation again. But yeah, I mean, best practices in here is do what you guys have been doing. You import the file, you look at what was loaded, what wasn't, the errors, and you compare it to the original extract, see what's going on. Did it load everything? Yep, I had 25 lines here. Loaded 25, I'm good. But if you encounter issues and you're not sure why it did that, um, that's when you reach out to us and we'll help you. Any other questions about the actual import document? Okay, I've got a note here to add those numbers, Jen, so I will get that done. Okay. Um, Let's talk about um, the actual turning off of the kiosk access. That's kind of the next topic I want to talk about. And um, do have that noted in the guidelines, how to go about turning it off uh, with your um, ITC kiosk administrator access. You can do that. So I think I still have that kiosk. There we go. Um, and so when you're ready to turn off the kiosk access in, uh, or the or leave request access in kiosk, sorry, I'm talking about the leave request here. Um, you are going to be unchecking this leave request box under the kiosk functionality. Um, and so when that happens though, these are the things we wanna make you aware of is when you're turning that off, it's restrict. It, they won't see the leave request areas at all in kiosk anymore. So um, if you still have um, maybe a certain user at the district or you as the ITC, you still want to be able to view those leave requests um, in kiosk in case you know the district has questions or um, you know you still have like maybe people at your ITC that still maybe the um, like a supervisor. Um, the leave administrator wants to view um, prior leave requests still in kiosk while kiosk is still available, um, it, they won't be able to do that anymore when you turn off the leave requests. Um, and so a workaround for that, um, and I'm just going to put this out there here in case, you know, you do decide to, you know, make those type of things still available. Um, for the ITC or for a specific person at your district is you can turn the leave requests back on, but in order 
to restrict users from creating leave requests in kiosk because that could happen is you could go down to the leave types and uncheck them all. So if a user tries to go in and create a leave request in, in kiosk, they aren't going to get very far because it needs the leave type. And if they try to click on it, it, it won't show them anything. So they can't create the leave request. But it does allow the leave administrator to still view calendars in uh, kiosk, still view prior leave requests in kiosk. Um, if you've got a district where the payroll person is still exporting out of kiosk, um, and let's say they do need to cancel somebody's leave in kiosk um, before they do the export, they will have the capability to do that now. So those are just some things that we've uncovered um, you know, while we're going through this process. So uh, that's just you know, turning it back on, but shutting all these off is the way, I mean, a user could, you know, if they still have access, standard user, if you haven't changed their password or anything, so they can't even get into kiosk anymore, if they still log into kiosk, um, they could still see their, cal their leave calendar, their prior leaves, um, but they can't create a leave request and won't let them. So, um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, any questions about that? Um, I know that um, some of you have asked in tickets and I know there's been discussion about exporting leave requests from kiosk into ESS. Uh, because, you know, when this all, when you did this conversion, you know, right away we were saying there were no leave requests that are going to be exported, like prior leave requests. You're not going to get exported out of kiosk and loaded into ESS. Well, <laughs> things change, right? Um, I don't know at this point if they're going to be able to do that, but I do know that discussions, that there are discussions about this. So I know it does add another level of complexity to that because it's a lot of information. You know, what you guys are importing in right now is just setup information, workflows, users, subcategories, leave requests. That's a lot of information in a leave request, right? So um, the developers, um, I'm sorry, I, I, we're talking about uh, leave requests, like, um, importing leave requests into ESS that came from kiosk, like prior uh, leave requests. Um, that's what we don't, that's what we don't know yet is uh, we don't know. And also how far back would we go, you know, extracting kiosk leave requests and importing them into ESS. So those are discussions that they're having right now, but uh, nothing no decisions or anything. We don't even know if this is possible yet. But if you guys have heard, you know, some rumblings, you know, from you know your the, your director or from others, um, they are discussing it. Um, but again, I don't know uh, if it's even going to be possible. Um, but I just wanted to let you guys know, keep everybody in the in the loop. Um, Carla's got a. On the prior topic, if we left leave requests on but turn off the different types, we would still need to export from a day prior to the change. You're not, yeah, right. You're not really going in and right. It's it's that's what the extract's coming from. So yes, if you did it today um, and made a change, um, I think the thing we need to be aware of is that. It's not pulling, like if you went in and uh, canceled a leave request in kiosk, that export of the CSV files, it doesn't matter, right? Because we're not storing leave request information. We're storing setup information. So I think you'd, you, know, you wouldn't have to worry about that. You could still export the CSV file from the, uh, from that day because it wouldn't have that. 
but the setup includes leave types. Right, the setup includes leave types. And that's one of the exports. Mm -hmm. So if you go in and turn that off, I'm thinking out loud. Got me thinking, Carla. You go in and turn those off in here. That's part of the configuration. <clears throat> and then you pull. But this is. But I think it's a whole timing issue here, right? Um, when, I mean, at this point, they're already using ESS. They should be, right? Um, you've turned them, you've converted them over already, and well, now you're just going. Yeah, I'm just going to unmute. I'm sorry. Um, That's fine. So, so it's just kind of our process has been, I mean, just kind of the way we envisioned it was that we would give them, for example, we're, we're doing all of our exports on Thursday mornings. So we're telling our districts on Wednesday, by Wednesday afternoon, you need to have all of your leave in your kiosk approved and exported. We're just telling them to go ahead and export it all and have it done. And then they can import piece by piece later, but that way they have one final export file. And then when that's done, we, we were going to shut leave off so that no one would inadvertently get in and request another leave after that. But okay. if you do that and the kiosk does the export overnight before the Thursday morning export from kiosk, now some of this stuff is shut off and we may be importing an incorrect configuration. Okay. So I think, so I think you have to keep in mind there, you're turning off this part, but um, it's still like, it's st the, the setup information is still pulled into those extracts, okay? Um, I, if you wanted to turn it back on afterwards, you're already converted over in order for, you know, that particular payroll person or for the ITC to still, you know, see that stuff in kiosk. I would definitely wait until after you've converted and you've loaded all of that stuff in to Kia or into ESS in order to shut these off. Does that make sense? Kind of like a timing issue. Yeah, and so and so our practice of shutting them off the night before to disallow any inadvertent leave is probably not the right thing to do. Um, I. I think it's okay, but you could just click that back on when you get over to the ESS side, click it on the configuration on ESS. Yeah. Michelle, that's, that's what I'm thinking like, and I think you're right with timing, just you do final approvals and, you know, we were thinking maybe even noon, right? Just, you know, and everybody's going to do something a little different. But final approvals, that allows the district then the whole afternoon to go in and get their export of all those final approvals. Then mm -hmm. after they've said they've got all their final approvals, they've got their export, then you go in and turn off leave request. Yes, when the files are backed up that night, they would create an extract, but the only thing that would be unflagged is leave request, right? Because you're going to go in and turn that off after they've told you everything is done. So then once you import into ESS, the only thing you're having to turn back on is leave request. You're not having to go in and flag all those leave types, right? Um, right. So that's what you would do in ESS. But then in kiosk, you'd go back in and you'd turn back on leave request or turn off leave request or leave it off and just unflag those leaves so they can view them, right? So you're actually doing two actions. You're 
turning on leave requests in ESS because it's the only thing that wasn't captured in your extract. But in kiosk, you're then leaving leave requests on, but unflagging the leaves, correct? So that people can still see what they want and you're only doing one change in ESS as an ITC as opposed to all of the leave types. Am I getting that right? Well, I think so, but then is the other possibility that you could just use the extract from the morning before you shut it off? Because you're not extracting actual leave, you're extracting configuration. So we, so it doesn't take note, and that's a great point. So it doesn't take note that a final export has been done, right? It's just configuration. It's not looking at any of those types Correct. of things. It's just, it's just configuration data, yes. Okay. Yeah. I see what she's saying, yeah. I'm not oh, sure yeah. what the best practice is, but you know, that was kind of our workaround when we ran into it with one district yesterday. So I just wanted to bring I that think, up. I think that's a good point though, Carla. I mean, and it, it is something that I think each ITC is gonna have to decide, you know, how are we going, going to do this? Should we pull it? You know, we before we turn off the leave request, um, you know, and then, you know, uh, so we've got that already marked or do we, you know, turn it off? And then we have to make sure that we turn it on in ESS. And we could test that out too, Mary. We'll, we'll test that out too and see how that goes as well. And if there's something that we feel would need to be added to the guidelines, we will. But yeah, that's a good point. So it then just comes down to a matter of, and I just want to make sure that I'm thinking on the right page. So I'm so grateful for this conversation this morning. Michelle, thank you for the opportunity for us to do this and bounce this around. So are we really just boiling this down to then a matter of if the extract grabs those settings, whether we're just changing one, which might be leave request or changing multiple, which could be leave types. Am, am I thinking that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yep. If that was Carla, thank you. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, we'll have to uh, dig that into that a little bit ourselves and just test it out and see. But yeah, if there are changes, um, you know, based on our conversations today, I have a feeling with all the chat information, I might have to do a little recap email to everybody afterwards, commenting on some of the stuff that was discussed here and just make sure that we're all on the same page. So um, we will look into this as well and see. Um, and then that recap email will, will provide some of that information. So thank you. Yeah, and Carly, you're right. We're all in this together. Okay. Go move on to my next topic here. Okay. Another thing that has come up in tickets and questions is, um, you know, we were talking about maybe the possibility of exporting leave requests into ESS. And that's, you know, something I just said a little bit ago that we don't know yet if that's even possible, but they are discussing it. Um, however, another option that can be done is when you see that those leave requests, like I said, they're stored in the in USPS file. And I don't know if my sample data has an in USPS file. Um, it may not. Um, so, and that's one of the ones that I told you has the leave request in it. Now, I haven't like digged into that folder of in USPS, but there are several different leave request files in there. And I don't know if one is all leaves of a certain type, all leave from a certain time frame, all leaves from a certain status, like in progress versus approved, but there's definitely more than one. Um, and so, it, but it's the, the saved leave request data in kiosk. So that is something that can be stored and saved, um, but I, at this point, I don't know how difficult it would be 
to pull that up, knowing which which one do I need in order to find somebody's leave request from kiosk. So there is another option, and I'm just throwing this out here. And I and um, if Andrew is on the call from Roco, this is from him. Um, he had mentioned it during, I think, maybe a prioritization working group or one of our other Fridays with fiscal. And um, it's an excellent way to pull the leave requests out of kiosk and um, store them in a spreadsheet. And I want to show you um, how that's done. And I think I put that here in this, yeah, in this document. So what can be done is in kiosk, the leave administrator it has to be a user with a leave administrator role. I'm not 100% sure if ITC kiosk administrator role has this as well. Mary could probably comment on that. I'm not sure, but I know for sure um, if you have leave administrator role, there underneath that, there is a drop down view print district requests. And what that will allow you to do is Whole, and they've got different levels here. You can extract unprocessed requests, so those are outstanding ones, approved and exported. I'm thinking definitely those, and canceled or rejected. So if you want all of them, you could go to each of those and run an extract. And when you go into that option, um, there is uh, ability to filter. Um, you'll see a filter option and you can filter by start date. And if you wanted to, you could go in. So yes, ITC admins have the option as well as leave admins. Thank you, Mary. And so you're able to go in and filter and you can put in a start date if you want to. In my example, got a spreadsheet pulled up so you can see what it looks like. Um, I just pulled from the beginning of the uh, July, uh, but obviously you'd be going back. Um, it just depends on how far back you want everything, or do you want to create several spreadsheets for di different date ranges? You can do that. But once you put in a date range um, and click on apply, um, then you have an option that will filter it on the kiosk grid. And then you have the option to download it into a CSV. And so this is what it looks like when it's done. And I just kind of want to show you uh, what all is on this spreadsheet. And I pulled the exported and approved, I think is what I did. Um, yeah, I, I named it that. And so the first few columns is just some junk data that A through D, but then from E on, um, you'll see stuff that makes sense here. You've got their name. So this every line is a different leave request that came in, pulled in. So first and last name, their job description, that again is from the leave request, what type of leave, um, if they do require subcategories. So in my sampleable district, they did require um, subcategories for their sick and professional leave. The subcategories are stored on here. The start and ending, the leave requested, the length of leave, um, whether, you know, this district uses days or hours. Um, the status, was it exported? Was it approved? Stuff like that. Um, you know, if I'm pulling something from obviously three years ago, that's all going to be exported. Um, if they use the sub uh, information in kiosk, which they didn't, or maybe they did, but they didn't do anything with it. <laughs> um, the date of last activity, I think is the, probably the date that it was, um, approved, you know, the last activity that was done against that lead request, and then the approvers. So, and it shows um, when, who, and when they did that. So that's pretty cool that it's got all of this information in here. And I believe, and I don't want to uh, misquote Andrew, but I think he said that they took this file and loaded it into the payroll archive in USPS. Um, and, and stored it there. Um, I don't know if anyone else can confirm that, but I think that's what he did. Um, so um, I haven't tried that yet, um, but um, that might be a possibility. Try it in a test account and see if it loads in um, or just store it somewhere. The district can store it somewhere. 
um, to kind of like keep track. And then obviously they know Excel, they can easily go in and search. Um, so will these types of records be able to be moved to docs, document store? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I would, I, I would assume if the USPS archive stuff is being um, stored in document store, once document store is available, it would, it would store that as well. But don't quote me on that, but that's a, a good question. We'll find out. Um, so that would be a great idea. It should be able to load in the other tab. That's what I was thinking too, uh, Jen, is that it should be one that you can load in the other tab. I just can't remember what Andrew said they did, but um, but yeah, I think this is another option. And you know, if we can't pull the leave request and import them into ESS, if that, you know, like I said, they're discussing that now and it's not going to happen, this could be an alternative, right? And pull this stuff in. Um, and it just, you know, they you be as creative you want with the filters and the spreadsheets that you want to load. You want to do it by year. Um, and then you have those years of lead requests by calendar year or fiscal year. Um, then you can do that. That way you don't have one large spreadsheet with 10 years worth of data on it. Um, so, yes, just things to to uh, um, you know, options that are out there. Um, and these are, you know, these ideas are coming from you guys. It's awesome. So thank you. We appreciate it. All right. Any questions about, uh, you know, that export option that you have available right now in Kiosk? Okay. Um, another thing I want to talk about here is uh, logging into ESS. Um, kind of wrapping things up, hopefully here. Well, I won't take too much more of your time. Um, and, yeah, and Rhonda, like just delete columns A through D. Uh, there, yeah, there's. It's just I don't know what this stuff means. It's just gibberish. <laughs> so I would I would clear that out just to make it clean. Exactly. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so the next thing I want to talk about is logging in. We've had a lot of questions about that and a lot of concerns, too, about it. And I think I just want to explain the process um, so that it makes more sense, uh, like the options available uh, when your dis districts are ready to, to initially log in to ESS. Um, and so I do have a little diagram here, too, to kind of talk through it with you guys. Um, so in our guideline here, we do have, and I did not put that in here. Somebody had recommended, hey, could you put the, um, go back in there. here. There we go. Could you put in the post import steps, the uh, email configuration? Um, because, uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, that email configuration needs to be set up, um, when, so that when lead requests are being submitted, it goes to the right person, whether it's the originator, whether it's the, um, approver. Um, and so we put that in, uh, to the post import steps. And so, and, and what we've noted is that, you know, there's an email configuration option. So if you have the email configuration set up in inventory or payroll or USAS for a district, copy, paste. That's all you have to do. It's nothing new, same information. Obviously, you might have to do a little tweaking um, based on the fields that were in, in each, but the whole root um, server, SMTP, all of that would be the same, right? So um, so you that definitely needs to be set up. And there is a test demo option underneath um, the system that if you just want to do a spot check on, make sure that the emails are working, you can, um, you know, send that to yourself, have the just, you know, send it to the treasurer, whoever, and make sure that uh, they're getting notifications. Um, and then another area is the leave request workflow configuration. Now, this is set up by default with default verbiage. 
uh, as to like what the user will get when they submit their leave. They'll get an email saying you create you created a leave request on this day, and it'll have all the details. And then their their approver will also get an email. And you know if you want to change up the verbiage, um, you can by going in there. But uh, most of it already has default settings. So those are just some of the things that are related to that. But you know configuring the email is the main thing. Got to get that done. Um, uh, one other thing too, in regards to this is, um, obviously, you know, like I mentioned before, passwords are not coming over from kiosk, right? So, um, the usernames do, um, but those passwords will need to be reset. Um, and that depends on if the ITC wants to do a bulk reset or the user can go in and use the forgot password options. So I wanna go back to that document I have here. <clears throat> because what happens is um, there is a configuration option um, and it's the forgot uh, password configuration. And I'll take you to that I've got. Yeah. Let me log out of Susan and log into my admin account. you where that's at. And it's in the configuration, it's the forgot password configuration. Um, and so it has um, a minimum uh, minutes and a minimum temporary length. And so I'm just focusing on the minutes. So what this means is if you go in and run the bulk reset to reset everybody's password, they get email configuration set up. They get an email that tells them, uh, here is your temporary password, and here is the link to go and set it to something permanent. From the time they click on that, sub or the time they click on their uh, bulk reset password, Time that user gets the email, in this case, they would have five minutes to go click on that link and change it. So it does not start on that link in the email. It starts when the password was initially reset. So that could be a problem. Um, if you're, you know, going in there now and, you know, uh, wanting to send them an email with their temporary password and a link, um, and they're not there yet, uh, what happens is that will expire, right? And if it does, um, the user can go in and use the forgot password. So if you're like, I don't even want to deal with doing a bulk reset because there aren't people in the, in the districts right now, um, then instead you can provide them with instructions and in how when they go to the main page, um, they can use that here, the forgot password link to set up their own temporary password in order to create a, a permanent one. And this document is kind of showing you how to do that. So whether a temporary password has been reset via bulk password or by using that forgot password link on the home page. Um, when they click on that, it is going, if they use the uh, bulk password or, um, yeah, if they click on the bulk password, it's going to, or I'm sorry, if they click on the forgot password on the user page, it'll take them to this screen here. I blow this up a little bit more. And basically they enter in their username. They should know that. Um, and it will then, once they tab off of that, they'll get a reset, reset password um, that they can click on. And then they get a little pop-up window saying, you're going, you're getting an email now with instructions how to change your password to something permanent. <clears throat> so and this is if they use the forgot password link. If you use the bulk reset, 
they'll get an email as well, and it will supply the password. Either way, they use the reset password to themselves or you did the bulk reset, they will get an email saying, you know, a request was sent, whether they did it themselves or you guys did the bulk reset for you to reset your password. Here's your temporary one. And then it provides the link to the ESS application where it then takes them directly to this window. And this is where they can go in and it should populate with their username. Um, but the old password will be the temporary one. So they probably wanna copy that, paste it in the old, and then they would put in their new password. And we've got you know the information into here as to how long it should be and all of that. Um, and then once they change their password then, they'll get a little pop-up notification in the corner. It'll take them to the login page and it'll say your password's been changed successfully. It can go log into um, ESS with their username and their new password. Is there a way for the forgot password option to be removed? We don't want them to use that option since we are updating them via their LDAP. Um, I don't know if that's in the functionality or not. I don't think it is, Valerie. Um, but uh, it the yeah, I don't think there is. But we'll you know we'll look into it and see if we can create a feedback request or something for that. So. You're welcome. So I hope that that kind of made sense here. Either they're going in and if you don't want to worry about bulk reset, you're instructing them to go in and giving them their use, um, um, taking, you know, giving them the URL to ESS and um, you've already created their account. They're using the forgot password link to send them that email. with their temporary password, they're then going to the link to reset it, takes them to this reset password link. And then from there, they change it themselves. If you want to do the bulk reset, then you need to be aware of that configuration setting. You wanna increase obviously the minutes. Um, that could be something that not sure if it would be helpful to use, you know, if they're not in, but if for, for some reason, you know, you need to reset passwords um, or if it's a smaller district and you're, you know, starting them in, you know, September, you're doing this in late August or September when they're already back in, you're like, all right, we just reset your passwords. You have four hours, you know, to reset them. Um, then, you know, you, you could do that as well. Um, they'll get that email and then they'll have that time frame to reset them. But either way, if they go in um, and they click the forgot password option themselves, it's still looking at that configuration. So if they're going in and you've got it set for 60 minutes, then they need to be aware that they've got an hour to go in after they click that reset to reset their password. Okay. Any other questions in regards to user login? Do you want me to like put this in a in a little better format than this, obviously? But you know, maybe put this in the FAQs and just talk about you know what they're going to experience when they click on the forgot password link. I could do that. Um, that's helpful. If so, you know, that's something we're going to get into the FAQs here in a little bit, but uh, that's something that we could add. Okay. Okay. 
Um, when it comes to, looking through my notes here. We have, um, like I said, when I was talking about the FAQs in our manual here, um, we've added uh, the roles information. I did want to talk about that. We've added an area in here that is like a summary of the roles, uh, the menu options by the, the role that the user has. I mean, this is kind of like, probably the first application where we've had a bazillion different roles that they can use, um, you know, based on, the, the, you know, whether they're a prover or a standard user or the lead manager or the data change manager or what. Um, and so what uh, we did is we did kind of a summary by the role of what they have access to in the system. So everyone has user role. You're, when a user gets created, it is set up by default with the user role. So they will definitely um, have all of those options, you know, that they have as a user, being able to see their profile, their position information, their leave balances. Um, if they're set up, configured to see their pay slips and W-2s, those will get pulled, those will be displayed. So um, standard users will be able to see all that, that is their own um, information. Um, the admin role is something that, um, you know, gives them the everything, access to everything. Um, and this is, you know, a pretty critical one. And that's something that as an ITC that you would um, have access to, it allow you to create users with an admin role. I mean, so it, it's got access to all the functions. Whereas a district manager role will give them almost the same access as the admin. The only thing it will not allow them to do is create, edit, or delete user accounts with the admin role. They can go in and create a user account with user role, with lead manager role, but they just can't go in, create an, a, a user account with the admin role. So that's the only difference between admin role and district manager role. And so, you know, it just kind of goes down and just kind of, you know, details all of this. Um, you know, what does the lead manager have in addition to their user role? Um, and, you know, with changes that are being made, some of the stuff might be, you know, might get updated. So I'm just giving you a heads up on that. Um, the leave request approver role, um, that is one. And the leave supervisor for staff role, those are the ones that, um, we are, you know, seem to get questions about, and I know we've had some tickets with, you know, this guy was a, a super uh, approver in kiosk and he doesn't have the role now. Um, well, there's a reason why, and that will lead me, segue me right into our FAQ section. I wanna talk about that. Um, so I'm gonna go right to that. And what we've done is we have those, questions we have added to this FAQ. Now, mind you, you'll see a lot of questions, but no answers. We're working on it. <laughs> we'll get those answered in here. Um, but the whole kiosk approver um, is answered in here. And there are really two roles that could come into play here. Um, we have a leave request approver role. Um, and what that will do is um, allow them to go in and approve a leave in ESS. So if the supervisor in kiosk um, was included as a group member, an approver in kiosk, they will automatically be granted the leave request approver role in ESS, how we've got that programmed, okay? If that supervisor was included in the staff's position record in kiosk, but wasn't in like a, a group member as an approver. They were just displayed on the uh, user's um, position record, with their name in there. Um, you know, this is coming directly from USPS and we can't convert that. Um, and so they will have to have 
the leave request approver role added to their user account. Um, and I trying to find the best way to determine that. And at this point, I haven't really found a, a good way to say, okay, who are who are those people? Um, but uh, um, right now, you know, it, if you run into that situation where they're like, I can't approve, I don't see the approver or the list of people I can approve when I log in, where are they? Um, I can't see their requests. Then that's a pretty good indication here that they need that leave request approver role added to their user account. And if you know you're aware of what who those people are, and instead of going into each individual account and adding it, you could extract those users out of the user grid into a spreadsheet, add that leave request approval role onto their existing roles. You would just add it onto it, and then you would import um, that in to update. We have a load option. Um, it's not the kiosk load. It would just be a regular. Uh, uh, load in um, ESS that will allow you then to um, make that mass update to their roles. Um, but I did want to talk about that one in particular. Um, I'm going to go back to the <clears throat> roles options. So yeah, so it explains it in more detail here um, about those different options. The leave supervisor for staff role um, allows users to just view. It doesn't allow them to approve. So if they just have this role, they can go in and see um, leave requests. They can go in and see their users' calendars, the leave requests on their calendars, but they cannot approve. Once you add that leave request approval role, then when they log in, the home screen, the pending windows, it um, there's a approval yeah, pending workflows task grid where they can go in um, and there's a leave request approval area that lists everybody. Um, and they can view and approve those uh, manually at the home screen. Or if they want to mass approve, they can go to the leave request approval option because this role will give them that option, that menu option in ESS, and they can go in and mass approve them there. So, um, and those things might change as well. I don't know. We might have an issue to mass approve at the home screen. I'm not quite sure. Be getting that mixed up with something else, but they will definitely be able to do mass approvals at this option. So Carla said they logged into each district's USPS and pulled a report showing all supervisors. Awesome. We are then providing the district with that report and instructing them to go in and add the roles for the appropriate supervisors. That's great. That's a great way of doing it. Um, our admin and district managers, the only roles that allow access to the configuration settings. Um, yes, and we do have that noted in there too. Um, the, uh, I think when we go into, let me go into this configuration. What we've been trying to do is in each of these pages is bold the role right at the beginning so that you can see it needs district manager or admin role in order for them to even see these. So we kind of did that with, um, we're trying to do that like uh, lead management role. You need lead manager, district manager, or admin role. And then again, that other uh, guideline that we put down here about the menu options kind of tells you that as well in more of a summarized format. So you don't have to go through each of the factors to, to get that. Uh, by the way, your YouTube short demos were great. Awesome. Um, yeah, and, you know, we did those, I think, last week. I think I did those last week. And then we were in our sprint meeting yesterday, and they've added some new neat features onto the leave request. So, yeah, I'm going to have to redo those. <laughs> but they are a good tool for now, for sure. Um, what Heidi's saying is, and I was Thank you, Heidi, because I was going to show you guys that is um, we do have YouTube recordings out there. We just keep adding new things in and I can't keep up. Uh, right, Mary? We just cannot keep up with it. Um, but we do have um, two options here 
where this one is, I'm sorry, this one is the, let me go, I'm going to do the playlist. I might have to get rid of that old one so it doesn't confuse people. But um, what we've done is we've added a user role access, a demo, and you can see it's about 20 minutes long, but, and we're going to put this in the next newsletter in August. Um, probably a new one in August, um, but it takes them through all the options that a standard user has. So we just go through the menu and just say, you know, you're going to see this if you're a standard user. Um, and then we had a, a chance to do the one for a supervisor as well. So if you're a supervisor, we talk about those two roles we just talked about, the approver role and just the uh, su supervisor role. Um, and so, uh, we talk about that here and what they're going to see and how they can approve leave. Um, so, and that's only about 11 minutes long because we didn't go through all the standard stuff. They can use, look at that if they want to see the other options that they themselves um, as a user in the system have access to that all other users see. And then this one goes in to just those add-ons as a supervisor. Um, so that stuff's in there as well. Um, and like I said, the FAQ page is definitely, um, you know, where we are doing a lot of our work. We want to give you guys as much information as we can. Oops, my mouse is acting funny. Um, and so, you know, we're going to be adding things and adding probably categories. And so, yeah, there will be a lot of changes to this, but um we feel like, you know, this has been helpful in the other applications, and we just feel like, you know, for you guys, if you have questions, your districts have questions, they can come here first and see, you know, if it's something, you know, a frequently asked question, it's probably in here that they can refer to. Okay, um, gosh, it's 10.30, I liked an hour and a half, I'm sorry. Um, before we uh, end today, I just want to ask those that have been through conversions. I know some of you have been giving excellent tips in the chat, um, but um, do you have anything else that you want to add that's been helpful for you during your conversions? Okay, and you know, there were a lot of good comments in here. And what, like I said, what I'm gonna do, you know, some of these that I couldn't answer, um, we will look into and I'll send out a cap email um, and uh, and maybe I'll just, maybe I'll, I'll attach that or maybe I'll send out like a recap document and attach that to the um, registration where you guys registered for this session. And I'll just put that in there in our like, like little presentations link so that you guys can reference some of the uh, answers um, that we found um, regarding the session uh, with the questions that you had in chat. So we'll just put that in there. That way you don't have to worry about it. Uh, we'll still send an email and saying, here's, we did finish up a recap and we'll provide the link um, in our registration page. And then you can read it there. Jen said, I would love a balancing checklist for things that the districts should verify um, uh, before uh, they go live. So it's a good one. Anyone has anything that they have worked on or something that they've done with their districts? That would be awesome. And I think uh, the next session that we'll probably do um, just depends if we're going to have to do um, a session on ASAP or if it's just going to be something we can talk about at a recap um, session that we do. I don't know at this point, depending on how much detail is involved in the ASAP integration part. Um, so we might be doing another Fridays with Fiscal on that. Otherwise, our next session will probably be talking about timesheets. Um, and we just don't have that, um, I think I have it scheduled on there, but um, we don't have anything, um, an outline or anything like that yet on that. 
Um, one other thing before we leave is <clears throat> we do have um, <clears throat> a couple sessions we're going to be doing at OETA. Uh, for those of you that are planning on, on attending, we are going to do a session on just ESS, and then we're going to do another session on timesheets. Um, and so I think um, State Software is going to be doing four sessions, and we're going to be doing a payroll and a USAS session as well. Um, but that's all I have. Um, I'm going to download that, Ashley. Maybe include that, too, in that recap page. Um, thanks, everyone. I, I hope this was beneficial for those of you that are just kind of getting started. Um, and listening to what the other ITCs are doing, that chat is awesome. You guys have been very helpful. Thanks, everybody. Um, everyone, you have a good weekend.